I've been given the thumbs up from the back of the room, which basically means get a move on, Jeff. We have to have you out of here in 45 minutes. So I'll make a start. Thank you for coming. It's nice to see a turnout. You never know with these things when they're being recorded. People say, oh, I'll just watch it later. Watch it later. And no one's here. So, but thank you. It's good to see you. So my name's Jeff, and I'm going to be talking to you about taking a mindful approach to product ownership. Um, who went to Deborah Searle's keynote this morning? And who went to Jia Zhang's keynote this morning? So we've got a mixture of people in the room. There was actually a common thread in both of those talks. Obviously, you can't be in two places at the same time, but I'm lucky that I've managed to see both of those talks. And um, this talk really is about the thread that was common to both of those talks, which is around having a choice about how you view things and how you react to situations. So I'm going to be following that thread in this talk here. Um, now, both of those talks were quite inspiring and focused very much on the positive side of things. But knowing that you have a choice about how you react and a choice over your emotions can be quite daunting. Because then if you think, well, if I do have a choice and I fail to make a positive choice, am I failing? Uh, so what I'm going to try and do here is to talk to you about a different aspect of choosing your approach to things, understanding where your defaults might be coming from, why it might be a little bit difficult in some situations to make the choice that you want, and perhaps a couple of techniques that you can try to give yourself a better chance of doing that to be more successful. This is in the product owner track, mainly because the product owner job, product owner role, is often described as an impossible job. It's probably the hardest of the three scrum roles. There are a lot of challenges to the product owner role. What I'm going to talk about here isn't relevant to just the product owner. It's relevant to basically anyone. Because believe it or not, product owners are human beings. And uh, just like anybody else, all human beings have some challenges. They'll have some stresses, some problems that they need to deal with. Product owners, uh, they have to deal with difficult stakeholders who have competing demands. They have to deal with budgets and time scales. They have to deal with developers. They have, to, uh, they have to deal with themselves. They have to prioritize. They have to deal with customers and users and getting feedback and giving feedback. All sorts of things that will make a product owner's job quite difficult while under a lot of pressure to deliver and receive some return on the investment that they're probably safeguarding. So my aim here is to help you understand what might be driving you. And once you understand what might be driving you, then you can use that knowledge to be better at mastering yourself, really. This is all about self-mastery as a product owner. Uh, I wanted to start with a quick story. I know technically I have already started, but um, a quick story. And I, I'm going to take you back in time. Some of you might not have been alive in 1981. But I want to take you back to 1981. Uh, in, in Australia, and what they call the Ultra Marathon. Has anybody taken part in the Ultra Marathon? No? Can't see why anybody would. But back in 1981, this was from Sydney to Melbourne. Now, I've never even been to Australia, but apparently that's quite a long way. It's uh, 544 miles. And if you type it into Google Maps, it says it will take you 187 hours to walk it. These people, for whatever reason, decided they wanted to run that to run that distance. And back in 1981, there were 150 world-class athletes, highly trained, who'd been training for months to do this, probably years, all in their you know, really expensive 80s short, short running kit, um, ready to go, primed. And there was one 61-year-old potato farmer <laughs> who turned up in his Wellington boots and his farming kit. And his view was, well, I spend a lot of time in the fields. I could probably run a marathon. Why not? And he looked quite odd lining up against these athletes in their, in their kit. His name was uh, Cliff Young. And you won't be surprised to know that he won this race. Maybe you are surprised. I don't know. The conventional wisdom at the time for running this ultra marathon was what they called 18-6. So you'd run for 18 hours, and you'd sleep for six. And then you'd run for 18 hours, and you'd sleep for six. But Cliff Young either didn't know about that conventional wisdom or thought, screw it. And he did what became known as the Cliff Shuffle. He basically just shuffled continuously 
for days. And while all these elite athletes were resting for six hours, he just kept on going. And he won. And that was quite surprising. So why am I telling you this story? Well, Cliff didn't go with the conventional wisdom. He didn't just go with, well, this is how we are going to do it. This is how we've always done it. Either through idiocy or naivety or bravery, whatever it was, he challenged their assumptions, your, their, your, uh, his assumptions, and he changed the way that these things were run. So I want to say this isn't a therapy session. Okay, I don't want anyone lying down on the couch. I say that because what I'm going to introduce, I'm going to introduce a model to you. All right, now all models are wrong. I want to say that off the bat. All models are wrong. But some models can be useful. So I introduced a model to you. It is based in therapy, and it's drawn from um, basically what happens to you as a kid will influence what you are like as an adult. But no matter what you do, if you've got kids, you will screw up your kids. It's just the case of how you will screw them up. All right? So it's not about you leaving here thinking, oh, I've been a bad parent, or I'm going to go back and be a better parent, or anything like that. It's not about resolving your childhood dilemmas or anything like that. It's just a model that I'm going to give you that you might be able to use something from. Uh, so it's not a therapy session. Uh, it's called the transactional analysis drivers. All right. Now, there are five drivers. They, they come from a couple of people's work that are not necessarily working together. Just in case you're interested, I put some references at the end. But they're basically from a couple of guys called... Uh, I can't pronounce their names, Taibi Kala and Eric Byrne. Uh, there's a couple of book references at the end. And what they found was that there are basically five drivers that affect people from the messages that they receive as a kid, a child. The first one is hurry up. Yeah, so be quick. Get on with it. Let's go. We're late. These kinds of messages that we give our kids, and they grow up with this hurry up driver. There's a please me driver. Yeah, so uh, make sure I'm happy. There's the be perfect driver, there's the be strong driver, and there's the try hard driver. I'm going to just briefly talk you, to you about these five drivers, why they're relevant to a product owner, and what you might be able to do once you're more aware of them. OK, so the first one is hurry up. Some symptoms of the hurry up driver. You won't be surprised to know. People start talking quickly. If you notice yourself talking quicker and quicker, it's probably this driver kicking in. You start getting nervous. You start getting fidgety. You might tap your feet a little bit more. You probably won't notice this until I mention it, but now you're noticing it. You're checking your watch. Possibly that's because you're bored of this session already, but this, am I late? Am I on time? When do I need to be at my next meeting? These kinds of things are going through our heads, often unconsciously. And then the idea of multitasking. So the, if you see these symptoms in yourself or somebody else, there's a good chance they're being driven by this hurry-up driver. So I'm going to ask you guys now, I'm going to take a risk uh, and ask an audience in Britain for some audi audience participation. What kind of consequences do you think this might have for someone in a product owner role if they're being driven by hurry up? Stress. Stress? Yeah? yeah? Make mistakes. What kind of mistakes? That are relevant to a product owner? Well, they're going to lose their focus on the product and start focusing on their schedule. OK, yeah, so they, they might focus more on their schedule than the product. Quality. quality might be compromised because we want, to, we want to get things out really quickly. Anything else? Less presence. Pre not less presence, yeah. People know that you're, you're rushing them. You, they get this sense that they want me to shut up. They want me to move on. Perhaps I don't even get to finish my sentences. I'm less present. I can pass that stress on. Deborah Searle, for those of you who are in there, talks about contagious positive attitude. And... Right, so we can pass that on to the team. They might feel that they have to rush things. They have to do more, do quicker. So we might end up releasing too early. Now, releasing early is a good thing in an agile environment. We want to be first. We want to be quick to market. We've got to beat our competitors. We talk about sprints in Scrum. But if we're, if we're driving too quickly on this hurry-up driver, then absolutely comp we could compromise quality. Now, you could say that was a nice little input there of me talking too quickly and stumbling over my words, just to make a point. It was an accident. We can burn ourselves out. We can burn our team out. Yeah, this is very hard to sustain in the long run. And we talk about sustainable pace. 
In terms of mistakes, product owners will also look at what we call surface level data. So in order to make good decisions, they're never going to make perfect decisions as a product owner because they're never going to have complete information. So they have to make some decisions, but if they're being driven by a hurry up driver, they won't really do the, the root cause analysis, they won't go beneath the surface, they won't draw the appropriate conclusions, they won't see the patterns in the data, they'll just make a quick decision, a quick decision and move on. So product owners, hurry up driver, not a bad thing, but it can quite easily get out of control. <laughs> the please me driver. All right, so kids that are grown up being taught, you've got to be, got to be good, got to be nice, got to make people happy, got to make people smile. If you find yourself or somebody else saying, is that okay? Quite a lot. Making sure they're not upset. All right. I don't want to cause any conflict, those kinds of questions, then you might be doing that. Asking people's opinion, often before you put yours forward, because you want to make sure you don't upset them or compromise them. Uh, avoiding conflict, not breaking rules. I quite like breaking rules. Um, so this one doesn't really affect me too much. But if you find yourself finding it hard to say no to people, that can be a symptom that you have this please me driver. Why might that have consequences for a product owner? Because you have asked for a miracle and you can't say no and unnecessarily you are adding stuff to the not Right, so people, loads of people are going to ask us for stuff. They know we're an easy win. Yeah, let's go and ask Jeff. He'll say yes. We'll get it on his backlog. And we get overwhelmed. Uh, it's really hard to prioritize, it's really hard to focus. We're probably multitasking, compromising everything. We get feature bloat, yeah? And then that compromises our hurry up driver because we've got too many features, we can't release it, which causes us stress and causes the team stress. So we've got to deal with feedback as well. Yeah, as a product owner, I'm putting my product out there in an incremental stage and asking for feedback. What do you think? How could this get better? What features would you like next? What do you think of the features that we've delivered so far? And if we can't really take that feedback in an impersonal way, that could be quite a destroying piece of uh, uh, communication. I take it very personally. And I may, re may hesitate in providing feedback to the team because I don't want to upset them. I focus so much on keeping people happy that I'm not going to make the ruthless decisions necessary or give the brutal feedback that's necessary to make this product a success. Prioritization could be a problem. And we could end up with a camel. Does that phrase mean anything to you? No. I was told that a, a, a camel was a horse that was designed by a committee. <laughs> I get into trouble because people like camels. And they said camels serve a really good purpose, but it's an analogy. The idea that no one really wanted a camel. Everybody wanted a horse, but they had their idea of what a horse was, and we ended up with a camel. Um, and as a product owner, if I say yes to everyone, I'm going to try and please everybody and end up pleasing nobody because I haven't really focused on my actual core user's needs. So Please Me driver can end up really impacting your product owner's success and also their stress levels. The third driver is called Be Perfect. Okay? So if we see uh, somebody with really, really high standards, again, this is a good thing. Just like pleasing people is a good thing. You don't want to be an arse your whole life. Sorry, I'm being recorded. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, my, my job is to swear less than Nigel Baker while I'm on camera. So I've set the bar there. I'm not, I'm not aiming for perfection, just less than Nigel. Uh, so high standards are a good thing, okay? but these standards have to be achievable. They have to be believed to be achievable. Perf people with a be perfect driver think very logically and rationally. Analysis is a good thing. We think if we analyze this problem enough, we can find the right answer. So we don't really act on intuition. Uh, we, we don't really like working, making decisions with incomplete in, uh, information. Uh, so if it's not a right angle, it's the wrong angle. You, you know people like that? You know, always putting their pictures straight, making sure their pens are there and the papers. There. That kind of like OCD. I love having fun with people like that. Um, the right angles. And this idea of control. Because if I let go of control, it might not be right. It might not be perfect. I can't really trust anybody else because there's only one way to do it, and that's my way. Yeah. So what consequences could we have as a product owner? Thinking about someone who's developing a product, working with a team, building something for users. What, what consequences might a be perfect driver have? We never finish. We keep going. Yeah? There's always something we could do to improve it a little bit more. Detail, too much detail. Too much detail. The little things will override the big things. Yeah? Sorry? No room to learn. Right, but if we're, if we're focused on perfection, then the idea of getting something wrong is quite scary. But in order to learn, we need to get things wrong now and again, or at least not quite perfect. It's that area where we're actually going to learn stuff. 
And from an agile perspective, we need to learn because we can't get something perfect straight away. We're operating in that environment where things are too complex. They're changing too rapidly. So this is going to be quite stressful for us if we can't manage this. So good, uh, we get less innovation, we get less learning, the time to market will, will, will drop because we're trying to get the perfect product, and we end up gold plating. Common problems for a product owner. The fourth driver is be strong. So this is, you know, you can do this, don't be brave, that kind of message that we send to our kids. Tough it out, keep going. So you often hear people say, yeah, yeah, I'll do that, I'll do that, I can do that. Uh, I probably don't need any help with it either. Yeah, I'm all right, I've got this. You can trust me, rely on me. Um, and these people also, when they see people struggling, will, will, can't resist the temptation to jump in and, and rescue them. All right. uh, because we, I, am, I am strong. Jeff, strong. I rescue. All right, this, this strong driver. Um, and these people, they are very fact-focused as well. This idea of feelings kind of gets in the way of being strong. We kind of hide our emotions and feeding, feelings, bury them down, because that is weakness. And very British. Feelings are weakness. Uh, so what consequences could we have if we're a product owner being driven by a be strong driver? <coughs> we take on too much work. Sometimes we delay because, you know, they can't take a help and they have to keep analyzing. Yeah, we get into analysis paralysis. We don't come up for air. We don't ask for help. So things just drag on. We don't, you know, the daily, yeah, I'm still working on that at the daily scrum four days in a row. I don't need any help. It's fine. It'll be done today. Sure it will. Uh, okay, yeah, things can go on. Anything else? Uh, you don't rely on your team. We don't really build a sense of team, absolutely. And the, in order to get collaboration with our team, we need to show vulnerability. And we need to let it be known that vulnerability is okay. We don't have to be strong all the time. Asking for help is a sign of strength, that kind of message we want to be sending out. So we will resist feedback because that will probably, um, probably undermine our feeling of strength. We're also less open to noticing our cognitive biases. Because, again, we don't want to show a sign of weakness. We actually want reassurance that what we're thinking is the right thing. So we will actually convince ourselves and reinforce that belief. We don't develop rapport because people don't feel they can trust us. They don't really feel open because they feel they have to be strong as well. So other people start playing it safe. We don't want to make mistakes because the, the leader's behavior, and a product owner is a leader, okay? A product owner is a very much a leader. People pay attention to the leader's behavior. The leader's behavior is one, the number one thing that affects the culture of a team and an organization. People pay much more attention to what you do than what you say. So you can say failure is acceptable. You can say we want to learn. You can say we want to inspect and adapt. But if you don't demonstrate it in your behaviors, the, dem the behavior is what people will copy. Because right? that's the safe thing. Final one, try hard. All right. um, so this is, and again, this is a good thing. Trying hard is a good thing. All right. And some of the messages behind it are a good thing. You know, it doesn't matter if you win or lose, just try hard, play the game, do your best, that kind of thing. It's a good thing. But if it overly drives us, then it becomes a problem. So here, effort is the most important thing. As long as you're trying hard, I'm not too worried about whether you're successful. This sense of justice somehow creeps in. All right. we, want, we want things to be just. We want things to be fair. So we spend a lot of time righting the wrongs of what's going on in the organization because that's not fair. It's about effort, making sure that we're in the right place. This, I, I'm not sure whether the, the phrase flogging a dead horse translates outside of England. Kind of, yeah. So there's no point whipping a horse that's dead, but we often do. We know this project is not going to succeed. We know it's a dead, uh, it's, you know, uh, the death march. But we keep going because that's what we do. Yeah. We don't give up. Uh, we often fail to meet goals, but that's OK, because we're trying hard. So we don't really push ourselves that much. These are kind of symptoms that we'll see. We notice that, think, OK, maybe we've got a try-hard driver going on here. So some consequences. It can be quite intimidating to other people. If they don't feel they have the same kind of resilience, you might have been intimidated by Deborah Searle's uh, talk. You think, well, I couldn't do that. You know? It's all very well her standing up there saying, I rode across the ocean, but I couldn't do that. I'm just a normal person. Uh, it's going to be quite intimidating, this try-hard driver. We get very attached to our views and very unlikely to let go of them. So in terms of collaboration, very fixed. And again, from a product owner's perspective, we're looking to iterate. We, we want to, uh, the best product owners that I know, they'll argue as if they're right, but they will listen as if they're wrong. 
So they will, they will be passionate about their, their views, their beliefs, their vision, the, the features, the sprint goals, all that kind of thing. But they will be open to feedback from other people. But if we're trying hard, we want to keep going in the same direction. We don't know when to stop. So we often end up with quite a lot of failed sprints. Um, because we'll, we'll try hard, but we won't actually make it. And that leads to a loss of faith from our sponsors, people who are actually funding this product. Unless I'm a product owner and I'm paying for this out of my own pocket, I've got to be answerable to somebody with the budget, somebody with the check. And these people, if they see lots of failed sprints, they're, going, they're just going to pull the plug. All right. Trying hard's all well and good, but if you're spending my money, I want to see results. So there's a problem. What can we do? Well, I said this is a mindful approach to product ownership. I, I did... I was toying with the idea of just sitting on the, a table at the front in a Buddha pose and saying, we're just going to meditate for 30 minutes and see how many people actually believe me. Um, but I thought, I'm video, so I can't really take that gamble. The idea behind this is if you can take a slightly more mindful approach. What I mean by, mean by a mindful approach is being more aware of what's going on. As, as Deborah Serlin and Zhang was saying, notice your thoughts, and you are, you, are, you are free to choose your thoughts. Accept that then you can reduce your stress, you can be more successful, you can build better relationships with teams, and you can build better products. So we get better products, and because people take, take notice of our actions, if we can be a little bit more mindful, then other people can be a little bit more mindful, and we can start role modeling this throughout our organization. So there's, there's, there's good reasons for doing it. What's involved? Well, the four A's. First of all is awareness, okay? So just notice it. Hopefully, I say hopefully, that might, might be a bit harsh. But yeah, hopefully, you'll have looked at some of those drivers and thought, yeah, that's me. That's me. Yeah, I can see how that must annoy people. It's not about saying, bad Jeff, okay, just being aware of it. That's the first thing that you can do, right? And once you're aware of it, just accept it. It's normal, all right? It doesn't mean you're bad. You can't, no matter what you do, you're going to screw your kids up. No matter how good your parents were, they're going to screw you up. You're going to be left with some baggage, right? This, this is just your baggage. Accept it. Everyone else has their baggage. So what? There's also benefits to it. So accept that. Take the positives of your be perfect driver. Then, once you've got some awareness and you're feeling okay with yourself, you've stopped beating yourself up about it, then just take some small action. Just do something, right? And then maybe adjust based on the reaction you get, the response you get. So what does that mean in practice? Well, as an example, question, what do I think will happen if, and put in your particular driver here, what, what do I think will happen if this presentation isn't perfect? So before, before you guys came in, I was thinking, right, I haven't done this presentation before. You know, what am I actually worried about if it's not perfect? Do I think people are going to walk out? Do I think people are going to throw fruit at me? Do I think I'll never get a job in my life again? What, what's actually going on? If I can name it, then I can, then I can analyze whether it's actually likely. All right? How likely is it that people will walk out or throw fruit at me or never, I'll never get a job in my life again? Maybe it is likely. But if it is, and I've named it, then I can start taking some action to reduce the likelihood of that happening. But there's also a good chance that I analyze it, and I think, do you know what? It's unlikely. People don't expect perfection. And also, you guys don't know what I was supposed to say. <laughs> so if I forget something, then what the hell? You don't know that. I'm the only one who knows what's in my slide deck. So I can assess whether it's likely. And then if there is anything I can do, maybe just to reduce that chance by 10%, then I'm in a better place than I was. So what could I do? I could rehearse. That's something I could do. All right? I could give myself some, some prompt cards. Or I had a I had, uh, wonderful AV person go out and get me a long cable so I could have my laptop here in case I forgot something. It's there. You guys didn't know that until I told you. But it gave me a little bit of extra security. So is there anything I can do to reduce that by 10%? And then if it does happen, if the worst happens, if my fear becomes a reality, what could I do to rescue that situation? How could I respond OK, so if you do start leaving, if you do start walking out, how could, I, how could I respond to that? Or if I do stumble, if I do make a mistake, what could I do? I could maybe make a joke out of it. That makes it a little bit easier for me to not be perfect. And then finally, if it does happen, how might that be a positive? So let's say this presentation isn't perfect, just hypothetically. All right. 
How might that be a positive for me? I'll learn something. I might learn that I never want to give presentations again. Maybe. What else? What silver lining could possibly happen from this presentation not being perfect? Someone else could learn something. Something else? Not to do it. Yes. You could all take away, if nothing else, I'm never going to present like Jeff. <laughs> and I've changed the world, right? I've put, a den I've put a ding in the universe. Good. Thanks for that. Anything else? <laughs> Sorry? I can get feedback. Okay, so if this is my job, and I have to do another presentation on Friday, hypothetically, then I might, that one might go better, yeah, if I'm open to it. So there are some positives to it. I might actually think, well, do you know what? It didn't, the world didn't end. It didn't go that badly. It wasn't perfect, but it wasn't that bad. And I can apply that knowledge to something else in my life. It doesn't just have to be about my speaking. I may have this perfect drive of something else. And OK, maybe that just reduces my stress a little. Maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that will help me in some other area. So that's the kind of thought process that we can go through there. Um, so going, going away from this, what can you do? Well, have a go at trying something different. OK? So ask yourself that question. What do I think is going to happen if I'm not perfect? What do I think is going to happen if I'm not uh, on time, if I'm a little bit late? I don't have to hurry up so much. And then keep track. Just at the end of the day, how many times did I take my time instead of rushing? One, two, three. That's three more than yesterday. And you can start changing your definition of yourself from I'm somebody who hates being late to I'm somebody who can tolerate that when it's not too problematic, or whatever your definition is more helpful. How many times did I ask for help today? One, two, three, keep track. And you start reminding yourself, this is evidence that you are not the person you defined yourself as a month ago, a more helpful definition. How many times did I say no? I said there were some references here. So there are a few books, um, and that they, they could be helpful to you. Obviously, I'm putting my own in there as well. Yeah. Um, and I have, thankfully, managed to leave some time for questions. I didn't know how much time I was going to have, but it looks like I've got 15 minutes. It's a bit of a gamble, but I have got a microphone. So does anybody want to be on camera? This is your moment. Anybody got any questions they would like to ask or discussions they would like to talk about? Anything at all around this area? Yes. Thank you. Could you please explore a little bit the relationship between those drivers and this uh, cycle, this improvement cycle that you mentioned in the end? The, this one? Yeah, this, you have this cycle on the one hand, and then you have those drivers. Yep. And I'm still sort of struggling of how to get those uh, two aspects together. OK, cool. Thank you. So the idea behind this cycle is that we can look at whatever driver I think is not working particularly helpfully for me. So if it's my, uh, my hurry up driver, I think, okay, this is, now I'm aware of it, I'm looking at it thinking, that's causing me some issues, all right? Either I'm highly stressed, my decisions I'm rushing, qu quality's being compromised, or the team are really struggling to, to meet their deadlines in the sprint or whatever. Um, what can I do about that? I want to redefine my value driver so that it's working more helpfully for me. And this is my thought process for how I go about just slightly adjusting that. So what would happen if I did take my time? I know people want this. They want me to reply to this email or write this report or make this decision by end of play today. What would happen if I didn't? What would happen if I took myself a little bit more time? What's going on in my head? What assumptions am I making? Do, do I really think they're going to sack me if I don't do this? Do I really think that the project will fail if I don't make this decision on time? I believe this decision needs a little bit more thought. Therefore, I'm going to make myself take a little bit more time. So listing out the assumptions, what do I think is going to happen if this? And there may be four or five. Work out which ones of those are likely, are actual, going to happen. Because I don't know if you're like me, but the, uh, while they're in my head, I tend to catastrophize. That's a good word. All right. I tend to blow things. These, these problems, they inflate. 
in my head. They just sort of bounce around, and I'm not naming them. But as soon as I label them, as soon as I write them down or, or verbalize them, possibly to somebody else, this is what I'm worried about. Said, really? You're worried about that? Really? Is that likely to happen? Do you really think that's going to happen? Well, OK, maybe not. Maybe there's a 50% chance of it happening. I can list them out. Some of them I can get rid of, because I know they're actually not worth worrying about anymore. Some of them, they are worth worrying about. And those ones, I'm going to try and reduce just by a little bit. I don't want to set myself, I get, get rid of this problem, but I can reduce it. And then I'm in a little bit more control. Some of the things might not be within my control. And accepting that. Deborah Searle again said, control the controllables. She can't control the waves, all right, but she can control her responses to them. So if it does happen, how can I respond? What would be the most helpful response for me? And maybe, maybe, just maybe, there is a positive that I can take from my fear becoming reality. And I can use that to redefine how much that driver controls me. About making the unconscious conscious. I'm in control of my thoughts rather than my thoughts being in control of me. Does that make sense? Thank you for the question. Yes, let's pass, let's pass the microphone. Let's see how quickly we can get it back. Keep your hand up so we know where we're going. You can shout, Mentos. Come on, Mentos. Um, I was wondering, uh, is this an idea that you... Uh, is this an idea that you uh, used with a real product owner? Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. So it worked? Yeah. Not, I mean, it's, it's not for everyone, right? It's a little bit touchy-feely. We're talking about their feeling. They've got to trust me to be open with these things. Yes, of course. That's in any coaching relationship. Right. But equally, it's something that they can, they can do on their own. If they think it's valuable to them, this is a process that you can take away. You don't need a coach for this. You can kind of coach yourself on this. But one of the prompts was potentially from somebody else. Yeah? Um, and, and Deborah was saying she had some strategies in place. She had her playlist. That was her self-coaching playlist. When she knew things were getting on top of her, she would put on her, her memories playlist or her no playlist. But equally, she relied on external prompts. So she got some text messages from people. She got text messages from her sister to just remind her to get back into that state of mind. And that's where I can play a part with some of the product owners that I coach, if, if that's something that they find, would find valuable. Thanks. Thanks, Mentos. Yes, just, just down the line. Maybe, maybe a similar question. Um, but where you notice these traits in others, what advice would you give to help them to come to recognize and address those? Um, it's an interesting one. I, so I, I, it's not about necessarily me uh, helping them do anything. It's, it's helping them beca become aware of it. If, if it's of value to them, if it's problematic to them, and it's probably more a case of analyzing what's going on for them. If things are working perfectly, why would they need to worry about this? Yeah, so it's analyzing something that perhaps hasn't gone particularly perfectly for them. What might be going on about that? And without being too cliche, you know, Michael Jackson, the only thing you can really change is the what's in the mirror, right? You can maybe affect your um, environment and your surroundings and things, but the, best, the thing you have most control over is yourself. So if they want to change something, if they want to make things better for themselves, then you can help by being that mirror if that's what they want. But I, I wouldn't go around saying, I think you're, you've got this going on here. I think you should change that. Yeah, that's not, that's not, I don't have the right to do that. Yes. Can we get the microphone back over here as well? Sorry. You want to shout? I can. So my question is, you are coming up with a 10% point here in this. I can reduce 10%, 10%. Yep. So is there any specific reason why it is 10% or why not 5 or why not 30? Yeah. So like, why specifically to that extent we are like, you know, compressing it? I would, I would say I picked 10% because of my culture, I would say. 10% is a small amount, it's manageable, it's a round number, people are attracted to round numbers. But I would take 1%. Yeah, it's about, it's just any kind of forward momentum. Generally, the people that I work with, 10% seems achievable. Yeah? Without being too daunting. Any other questions? Yes? Do you want the microphone or do you want to shout? Have the mic. Um. In the title of your 
presentation, your yep. talk, you had the word mindfulness. I was okay. just curious to know whether you practice mindfulness yourself. Yeah. And if so, would you like to um, share? Sure. So um, mindfulness is a big thing in our household at the moment. Um, so I've got, uh, I've got a 16-year-old daughter. Well, she's nearly 16, 16 next, in a couple of weeks' time. And I've got a 12-year-old son. And I, I think I'm a, I'm a decent coach, but I can't coach my family. <laughs> okay, I, I coach my son's cricket team, and everyone on the team will listen to me but my son, all right? <laughs> so uh, I, I've given up trying to coach them, but what I can do is I can give them some tools, and so, um, and I can share my experiences. And so, you know, when things are overwhelming for me, then I've got this little app called Headspace. Some of you probably come across. I'm not, I'm not advertising. I don't get any money from it. There are other apps available. Um, but that's the, that's the one we currently use in our household. And so my son's struggling at the moment. He's got some uh, injuries that he's, you know, he's, he can't play sport. And it's getting him down. He's not able to sleep at night. And he's getting stressed and things. And so he won't listen to me, but he'll listen to the app, saying exactly the same thing. So every night before he goes to bed, he just puts his headphones on and he listens to this, you know, get more in control, know where the pain's coming from, be more aware of it, and then you can start to manage it, that kind of thing. Um, and so mindfulness, working out where things are coming from, working out where your thoughts are coming from, where your thoughts are directed, and which ones of those are helpful or not. As with anything, it's a practice thing. It takes patience, it takes repetition, um, and it also takes a little bit of, well, certainly for me, a little bit of bravery, because that was a bit touchy-feely for me to begin with. Um, now I'm admitting it in front of a camera, which is a bit weird. But <laughs> thanks for the question. Okay, I've got a few minutes left. Yes. Uh, so I think the is that pink salmon, salmon colored jumper. Thank you. So is the idea of the drivers that everybody fits to one single driver, or can I have a mixture of? You can have as many as you want, mate. <laughs> <laughs> For what it's worth, I'm messed up. So, yeah, you know, I, I, I'm impatient. I have a hurry-up driver. I, I've been taught these messages, be strong, don't ask for help, that kind of thing, which is why I'm an independent and I'm not part of the company. Nigel will tell you, Jeff's a lone wolf. He doesn't ask for help. The, so I've got a mixture of these kinds of things as well. Yeah, so you can be as messed up as you like. Uh, and then pick whichever one is working for you the most. For, leave that one and focus on the one that's causing you the, you know, the most problems at the moment. Make some progress in that. And what you'll probably find is once you start getting more in control of one of them, that knowledge, that awareness, that mastery will help you in all of them. Yeah. Uh, but by the time you get to that one, you've forgotten what you've done over there. So it's a constant process, right? It's, it's, it's life. Okay. Thank, Thank you for the question. And blue shirt? Hi, sorry. Um, just as a question, Jeff, I'm really interested in the coach. I mean, why are you not able to coach your kids? And what can you share with us in terms of them? Um, it, it, was, it was a little bit flippant. I can. I can coach my kids but only when they want to be coached, all right? So they know what I do, but equally, I think it's a, I mean, without getting too deep into the whole sort of psychoanalysis thing, kids want to prove themselves to their parents, right? They, they, they don't want to ask for help. They want to they show off. They want to show what they can do. Um, so asking for help for your parents is, is, not, is kind of their last resort, if you like. Um, I can when they want to be, but usually I have an agenda as a parent so I can't be completely neutral. Even if I want to be neutral, my kids don't see me as neutral. They see me as a parent who wants them to go to bed on time, who wants them to do their homework, you know, these kinds of things. But if they, if they get to a point where they think, okay, this, they, they might be able to help me, then they will ask for that. They, they know what coaching is now. Yeah. Yeah. One of my uh, favorite quotes is from, from uh, Esther Derby. Some of you will know Esther. And she said, as a coach, coaching has to be voluntary. Okay? You can't go around inflicting your help on people. And, and, as much, and that's, that's one of the most difficult things as a parent, isn't it? Right? You see your kids. You want to help them. I don't want to tell them what to do. I want, I want self-actualization. I want them to own their, be more own, yeah, that kind of thing. But I'm, not, I'm the wrong person for that. Yeah? I'm almost the last person. But sometimes, sometimes. Thank you for the question. There was another hand around here somewhere. Yeah. If, you, if you've got an example of, um, of yourself 
Uh, my presentation one? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'm a patience thing. So I'm, I'm getting a little bit more. Uh, actually, somebody, somebody asked me a while ago. So, you, so I've been teaching. Part of my job is I'm, I teach Scrum. And somebody asked me a while ago, you've been doing this for like 14 years now. What's different? What's different in your approach to when you started? And my answer was, I care less. And you know, exactly, right? I got this for everybody else. You care less? Well, I'm not coming to one of your training courses. Um, <laughs> so I was asked, what do I mean by that? And, and I said, well, at the start, I took it upon myself to make sure that they left with every piece of knowledge and that they were going to go out and change their worlds from day one. All right? And if anybody you know, had a feedback mark of less than five out of five, that I obviously hadn't done my job. Now, I know I can't control that. I'm a little bit more aware of that's my thought process. And I've set myself more realistic targets for those things. It's up to them to care. Okay? My job is just to give them potential that they could use. So that's, that was what, what would happen if they didn't leave? And how could that be a good thing? Well, they might actually find out that Scrum's not for them. And that's success as well, right? So that's, that's, I didn't even realize I was kind of doing that. That was just sort of emerged over time. But if I'd have been more <coughs> conscious about that, I could have saved myself a few years of stress. Thank you. OK, we've got, probably got time for one more question. Yes? Um, I've lost the mic. Where's the mic? All the way back. Just because you're at the front, and you're speaking this way, and they're that way. So. Have you ever experienced uh, a culture where that mindset doesn't fit? Have I experienced a culture where, what, so the mindfulness? Yeah, but the approach. Um, when you say culture, do you mean organizational or, or national or okay. organizational? Organizational. No, um, because I found that no organization, well, no, no, no organization has such a coherent culture that the whole of the organization wouldn't be open to it. But equally, I've never known <clears throat> an organization with such a coherent culture that all of the organization would be open to it. And like I said, I wasn't. It, it took me a while to come around to the fact that this could be useful for me because I had this be strong driver and this was a form of help. Um, and so people have to be in the right place for it. They have to feel safe to do it. But there will be somewhere in the organization, someone, some department, some, some island of safety where they will get some value from this. And then it becomes a case of, they've changed. What are they doing? Curiosity. People are nosy. Yeah, they want to know. And this, this, this started the same kind of thing with, with regards to Scrum when I was at British Telecom. We had such a big company that as a company, you'd say, no, they're resistant to it. But there were some pockets. And when those some pockets had some success, other people were curious. And so we started, so what are you doing? What's this, what's this rugby thing? Um, it seems to be working. I want some, can I have some rugby? <laughs> and, and it started to ripple out. And it's a, it's a case of patience, really. And again, not inflicting your help, putting it out there. If they want it, they'll pull it. If they don't, they won't. Yeah. Thank you for the question. OK, I need to wrap up. I took a gamble on, on getting you involved, and I really appreciate you joining in, asking some questions as we're going. Thank you for that. Um, I've enjoyed it. And I hope you carry on getting more value from, from the gathering. It's a great place. There's loads of great sessions coming on. So enjoy the rest of your day and tomorrow. Thank you. <laughs>